All right, in this video, I'm going to talk about the Bohr's model on the back of your reference table. Now, I know the last video I did was a little confusing, and my intention is, is that when you are completely done watching these first videos on quantum theory and spectral math lab and doing that it all sort of comes together, but it's sort of hard to capture the idea in just one video. So what I'm going to do with this video is I'm going to start by talking about waves in general and then we'll look at the Bohr's model and try and tie the last video with this video. So we said that uh, Einstein figured out that light was a photon that had a certain amount of energy. But we also know that light is a wave. So we need to understand some different parts of the wave. So if I just draw a generic wave, this. It has what we call a wavelength. It's one cycle of the wave. So it's from here to here. So that is written with this Greek letter like this. And it's said to be wavelength, the length of the wave, right? And it's typically measured in, oops, I spelled that wrong. It's typically measured in uh, meters. Okay, and for light, we give it a, we use a prefix for it, but it's a length measurement, so we measure it um, in meters. And um, light also has something called a frequency. So the frequency is how many wave cycles go by in a certain period of time. So something that a wave that has a high frequency is going to look like this. It's gonna, you're going to have a lot of wave cycles go by in a short period of time. Right? So that would have a high frequency. And then you could have something that has a low frequency. Right? So you can see that the frequency and the wavelength are actually uh, correlated to one another. So this is high frequency. And this is low frequency. And they actually have an inverse relationship. And we'll talk about the math in a video, a later video. But you can see something that has a high frequency, it has a small wavelength. Whereas something that has a very low frequency has a relatively larger wavelength. Now, something that has a high frequency is something that is considered to be high energy, right? So there's a lot of energy in this wave. This is a high energy wave. Whereas um, something that has a low frequency like this has low energy. So the relationship between the frequency of light and the energy of the light and the wavelength are all used to understand something about electron arrangement. And I'll talk about what that means. So if you'll notice on this, I drew my small wavelength and my big wavelength with different uh, colors. That's because your wavelength also determines your color. Okay, so the wavelength also correlates to what we see, the color that we see. Okay? So, now let's take just that basic information and let's look at the Bohr's model. So, on the back of your reference table, we have the Bohr's model for hydrogen. Now, we know hydrogen is number one on the periodic table, so it really only has one electron, and that electron should be in the first shell, and that's what that N means. This is the first shell where the electron typically exists when it's in what we call the ground state. So if the electron's right here, that represents the ground state. However, we talked about exciting hydrogen, right? Exciting the atoms. So if I were to like plug hydrogen into an outlet or light it on fire, it's that electron is going to absorb that energy. It's going to start jumping like crazy around in that atom. And when it absorbs the energy, it jumps up to an excited state. So let's say it jumps from like 1, and now it's up here in the 4 shell, and that is an excited state. Right? 
Now, when you excite the electron, it takes energy in. It absorbs energy. So when that electron is then going to drop back down to a, um, its ground state, that energy has to go somewhere. So if it drops back down, how does it get rid of that energy? It releases it in the form of a light wave. So something with these down here correlate to uh, the wavelengths. So something with a small wavelength or a high frequency light, you know, it's right here. So basically what this does for us is it tells us something about the arrangement of the electrons in an atom. When we excite them and they start jumping around like crazy, they start to give off light that we can see and that light then is um, interpreted and it actually helps us to identify different elements. So the light that hydrogen gives off is going to be different than the light that helium gives off and the light that, you know, neon or any other element gives off. And it all has to do with that electron arrangement. And this is how we figured out the electron arrangement. We can't see electrons, but we can see this. We can measure this. So in order to use the Bohr model, uh, you just have to look and see uh, what shells it's jumping between, right? So if we look here and we see, okay, so that one hydrogen, it, or that one electron in that hydrogen has jumped up to here, right? Now it's in what is N3. And then let's say it falls back to N2. There's a certain amount of energy that is released when you go from N3 down here to N2. And that is going to have a different wavelength of light. So when it goes back down from its excited state to its ground state, now it's got a wavelength of 676, which is a lot bigger than 97, right? So it's going to look like this. So some types of questions that you could be asked were, are like, what type of light or what is the wavelength when a hydrogen atom goes from N equals 3 to N equals 2? And so your answer would be 656. And that is measured in nanometers. So nano is a prefix. Nano means times 10 to the negative 9th meters. So just like kilo means times 10 to the third meters, or milli means times 10 to the negative six, nano is times 10 to the negative ninth. It's really, 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 really tiny. So it's 656 nanometers. Now, because of the different shells, not all of the light that comes off is stuff we can see. Some of it we have to measure. You can't see, we can't see UV and we can't see infrared. We can see visible light. But the infrared and the UV are sort of out. You need special instruments to do that. But note that they are part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay? If we look here, the electromagnetic spectrum is basically a bunch of different light waves, but they just have different sizes and they, or they have different frequencies. So here you can see this is something that has really long wavelengths. This is something that has very short wavelengths. And up here is supposed to be the frequency. So 10 to the fourth is a very big number. So there's a high frequency with a, or sorry, there's a low frequency with a, um, with a long wavelength. Okay. So <clears throat> these numbers right here tell us jumping from one shell to another what will be the wavelength of the electromagnetic spectrum or the wave that will be released when an electron goes from excited to a ground state. We could be asked to tell the exact uh, wavelength in nanometers. We could be asked to say whether it's UV visible or infrared or even more into detail if we go down here you can see we could be asked the color. Now note that this color is given in meters. So we had said 656 nanometers. Well, let me just write below what that means. 656 nanometers is equal to 656 times 10 to the negative ninth meters. Okay, remember I just showed you that 
right up here, times 10 to the negative 9th. However, we know that that's not the correct way to write scientific notation. So if we were going to write it properly, it would actually be 6.56 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. So we look and we see, okay, that falls into this range. So a uh, electron, let me just zoom out again, in a hydrogen atom that goes from shell 3 and then falls back down to shell 2 emits a wavelength of light that's 656 nanometers and is the color red. So the whole point behind this entire thing is to show that we can actually figure out and calculate the amount of energy that an electron has when it moves from one location to another and by doing that we then can determine the actual location of electrons in an atom. So that's how we know where electrons exist within an atom. In the next video, I will then go, I'll go even further into detail and we're going to look at the math of this and how we actually quantify it more than we even see here.